So what can we use this bond spring model for? Well, well, we can use it for, for a number of things, and we will over the course of the semester. One thing we use it for is learning for learning how or why uh, various contact forces like tension and compression behave the way they do. So, for example, here is our copper wire again hanging from the ceiling. kilograms at the end, two meters long. And um, you look at the system of the stationary mass, we said that the gravitational force downward is 98 newtons. And then the tension force, the force that the wire exerts up on the <coughs> block, is also got to be equal to 98 newtons, right? That just comes from the momentum principle and the fact that we know that the momentum isn't changing. So I take the 10 kilogram mass off of the wire and instead I hang a 100 kilogram mass on the other wire and hopefully it doesn't break. I, so it doesn't break, let's say, and it's just hanging there. What's the gravitational force acting on the 100 kilogram block? 980 units, all right? What's the tension force in the wire? 980 newtons. You know that's got to be true because, again, the momentum isn't changing. <coughs> but it's the same wire. So how does the wire know to exert more force on the heavier object? Okay, it's like a spring. It's just going to stretch. We can measure it, right? Young's modulus tells us if I hang a bigger mass at the end, what am I going to, what's going to be different about the wire now? It's going to be longer. It's going to stretch some more, right? So at the atomic level, what's going on? All the bonds are stretching, right? Throughout the entire, and that's what we mean by tension force, right? When we say the word tension, we're talking about a stretching of the interatomic bonds. Okay. It's really what it comes down to. And so, you know, you're, you have a rope, okay, and you're pulling on something, and you're, you can, there's a tension force in the rope, the rope becomes taut or tight. And at the microscopic level, the rope is stretching a little bit. Okay? You're trying to pull something apart. There's, the bonds are stretching a little bit. And the more they stretch, the greater that force is going to be. Right? So similar type of situation if you are uh, you, know, you, have, you have something on the floor. Right? So here is a uh, same sort of thing. There's a 10 kilogram object on the floor, okay. and gravitational force exerted on the object is going to be, again, 98 newtons. And the object is just sitting there, so there's got to be another force acting on it due to what? The floor. And how big is that force? 98 newtons. Okay, the floor, the floor is exerting a force upward. Again, the momentum principle tells us that the change in momentum of this one block system is equal to zero, so the net force is equal to zero. The net force is equal to zero, then those two forces in opposite directions have to have the same magnitude. So I take the 10 kilogram block away and I place, same type of idea, I place a 100 kilogram block there. And the gravitational force is 980 newtons now. But the force of the floor is now 98 newtons. Well, the floor is pretty smart. It knows how to exert a larger force on a larger object, right? So the floor is intelligent. It's got consciousness. Uh, 
probably not. What's happening to the floor? It's impressive. It's impressive. At the atomic level, if I push down more on our ball and spring model, then all the atoms underneath, the bonds all start to compress, right? And so the, great, the harder I push, the more they compress, the larger forces back on me. So you can actually, in, in fact, in, in for really large masses, you might even be able to observe it. Okay? For an ordinary object, we don't see, you know, I have a, an eraser on the table, and I don't see the eraser compress or the table compress that much. It's not with the naked eye. But for something very large, you might actually see the floor kind of indent, right? I mean, there's a compression in the floor. So at the atomic level, we can draw, again, using this model. Something like this. I mean, this is a really exaggerated picture that I'm going to draw. So it gives the flavor of what's going on. Where these bonds underneath are compressed. And then these bonds are not as compressed. So there's a compression force where, the, obviously, where the bonds are compressed. And so there's going to be a force along the line of that compression, and so there's going to be a force directed back upward on the object. And that, so compression. And the force is directed perpendicular to the surface. And if you have that situation, compression force perpendicular to the surface, that has a special name in science and engineering. We call it a normal force, yeah. So I'm going to say this is called a, uh, a normal force. It's, you shouldn't think of this as a fundamental force. Neither a tension or a compression is a fundamental force. It's just boiling down to these forces of interatomic bonds. And ultimately, they're electrical in nature. Right? So these are sort of all, all these contact forces are essentially electrical. So normal meaning perpendicular to the surface. This is the mathematical or geometric meaning of the word normal. Um, oh, okay, so one other thing before I go on with this that uh, I don't think we talked about, so let me get, come back to this. Young's modulus. We can also relate Young's modulus to this interatomic bond stiffness, the same bond stiffness that we calculated last time using the springs in series, uh, springs in parallel argument. And the idea is this. Let's go back to looking at something hanging. Instead of hanging a uh, uh, mass at the end of the wire, I'm just going to look at two copper atoms kind of hanging, one hanging from another. So essentially, it's a wire that is one atom thick and one atomic bond long. So that's length D, and this is width D. And if I hang one atom from another, and if I look at the system of this hanging atom, just like there is, was in the tension case, there's going to be two forces acting on it, right? One force is going to be due to what? Gravity. Okay, so this is going to be a force, gravity on the, on the atom. So that's going to be the weight of one atom. And the other force is going to be due to the spring, right? Due to the spring, the spring-like bond. So this is the force due to the interatomic bond. And what do we know about those two forces? They're equal. Okay, so the force of gravity is equal to the force of the interatomic bond. Now I can, I can calculate what the mass of the atom is and multiply it by 9.8. But let me instead write this in terms of the interatomic bond force. This is a spring, so I'm going to write this as the spring stiffness, the interatomic spring stiffness, times the stretch of that interatomic bond, right? Young's modulus is a material property, so I can apply this 
to a two meter long wire of copper, or I could apply it to a two atoms of copper. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a bulk quantity, it doesn't matter how much of this stuff I have. So I can say that Young's modulus for copper is force per unit area divided by delta L over L. Okay? Well, what's the force? The force is going to be that tension force, or that case of S interatomic times S. What's the cross-sectional area of a wire that consists of yeah, D squared, right? It's just the width of, of one, or the cross-sectional area of one atom. And we're treating these atoms like they're in cubes, each cube with a length D on the side. Okay, so that's D. The area is D squared. The change in length I'm calling S, the stretch of that bond, and the size of that bond is just D, right? The, the distance from one end to the other. So let's work this out. S is going to cancel out. One factor of D is going to cancel out. And now we have a relationship between the case of S interatomic, the size of an atom, and Young's modulus. Okay? Another useful relationship between micro and macro quantities. Macro, the Young's modulus of the material. Micro, the interatomic strength difference and distance. We can actually calculate this for copper. And last time we worked out that D for copper was 2.28 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And uh, so we can say that K sub S interatomic is Y times D. So that's 1.3 times 10 to the 11th newtons per meter squared times 2.28 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. What do you get for interatomic spring stiffness of copper? Well, that's good. 1.311 times 2.28 minus 10. 29.6. So about 30 newtons per meter, which we kind of hastily went through at the very end of class, but we'll, this is the same number we got by working out K sub S the other way, using the springs in series, springs in parallel argument. Okay, so it works. This is an easier way to do it because you know Young's modulus, you know the interatomic springs, uh, this, or you know the, uh, the size of an atom, you can calculate the, the uh, interatomic springs. Okay, that was a little aside. I wanted to mention that earlier, but let's come back to this model again. Tension and compression forces. So, <coughs> Ball spring model, uh, we can use it to explain tension. We can use it to explain compression. And there's one, one other very important contact force that we have to uh, think about. And let me show a picture that comes straight out of the book. I don't want to draw it because it's kind of complicated to draw. So let me just show this so everybody can see it. What's going on here? We have... We have the block sitting on the table again. Okay, and so we see that there's a compression force because these uh, interatomic bonds are compressing below the below the uh, block. There's a normal force upward. But now what I'm doing is I'm taking the block and pushing it horizontally. So I'm applying the force to the right. And because the block is now in contact with the atoms on the surface, and so there's an attraction there, there's a, a bond there, and it's going to try to drag those atoms with it. Okay? And you see what happens. Along the, so parallel to the surface, there's a stretching here as one atom gets dragged away from this atom. And then in the front of the block, there's sort of a compression here as one atom gets pushed into the next atom. So we have not just the compression vertically. We also have compression and attention along the surface, horizontally. So that's going to lead to another force. We call that force what? That's friction. That's friction. That's right. Okay. So frictional forces. And you can kind of see if, uh, again, 
if I'm pushing these, this block forward and I'm compressing this bond, and I'm dragging these atoms with it, so here's a compression. So that, if there's a compression, that's going to want to push back in that direction. And if here along this direction there's a stretch, that's going to want to push back along that direction. So this frictional force is kind of opposing the force that I'm applying. Okay, if I push it one way, the frictional force tries to push back in the other direction. And friction is a really complex phenomenon. And it's really a hot topic of research, including in this department. Uh, the physicists here are working on uh, the microscopic explanations for friction. And uh, this ball and spring model is really an oversimplification of what's going on. But we'll just kind of use it for right now to get a sense of how I'm going to deal with this. <coughs> and again, another mathematical oversimplification. And by the way, now, so now we have sort of two forces here, two components of the force of the table on the block if I'm pushing it. So here's the applied force. And so there's a force parallel to the surface I call friction. Usually we use a little f. There's a force perpendicular, which is called the normal force. And the sum of those two, which would give us a vector in that direction, is the total force due to the floor. Okay, so we can think of it as decomposing the force of the floor into two components, one parallel to the surface, one perpendicular to the surface. So we have friction is the parallel part, normal is the perpendicular part. The uh, way we can, there's two, oh, let's put it very this way. Two types of friction, roughly speaking. We have static friction which is when the object is stationary, object not moving. We have kinetic friction. The object is moving, it's sliding along the surface. And very, in the sort of a simple approximation, we can, we can model these mathematically, these forces, with an equation. We can say that the, for static friction, static frictional force is less than or equal to mu sub s times the normal force. So mu sub s here is the coefficient of static friction, which is a property of the materials in contact, property of the surfaces in contact. Okay, so there's some, usually a, a number between 0 and 1, and it's a, uh, you know, there's some value for, say, wood and uh, metal, or rubber and steel, or something like that. For kinetic friction, it looks similar. It's equal to mu sub k times f sub n. So this is the coefficient of kinetic friction. Which might be a different number than the static friction number. Both of them depend on the normal force, meaning the greater the normal force, typically, the greater the frictional force, because you're just pushing the object down into the surface more, there's going to be more contact and uh, more interaction between the two surfaces. Okay? Now, we don't have time to talk about this, so we'll talk about this next time. But the key idea here is that static frictional force doesn't have to be equal to this. It could be less than this. So it, it builds up to some maximum. After, if you go beyond that maximum, you break the static friction, and can actually get something to move. The kinetic friction force is a constant. Once it's moving, no matter how fast it's moving, it's the same kinetic friction force as, as a constant, just depending on that coefficient. So we will do some more with this uh, next time.